Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and to be invited to be part of this wonderful series of lectures. So, yes, as Magella said, today we're, we're starting to look at Catholic Church music, and uh, the title of the talk, Gregorian Music in Three Parts, Please, should have started ringing bells for anybody who knows anything about church music. And Gregorian music in two and three parts, please, was a request, a frequent request, mainly from nuns around the country, in many letters written from convents to Heinrich Beverunga, the first professor of music at St. Patrick's College, Maynooth. And he was one of the most significant personalities working towards improvements in Irish Catholic church music during the late 19th <coughs> and early 20th centuries. And I'll come back to him later on. But Gregorian music in three parts doesn't exist because Gregorian chant is monodic. And so the nuns' innocent requests laid bare the dearth of educational focus on liturgical music training. And unfortunately, that's an omission which continued throughout the 19th and 20th century in Ireland. So the dates which are bookending our survey, um, they're somewhat arbitrary dates. They're, they're useful because they, they mark significant political events. But from the point of view of Catholic Church music, there weren't specific developments at either of those two dates. But it just serves to sort of bookend um, a continuum of a rise and fall of, of reform throughout the whole period. So Ireland in the 19th century was a country in transition and turmoil, politically, socially and culturally. A number of significant events contributed to societal change. The famine, it caused a decrease in population and change in land, land ownership structures. And the general provision of education in English contributed to the decline of the Irish language and its consequent impact on national identity. Catholic Church disciplinary reform had significant ramifications for religious observance among the population at large. The political activities of the Land League sought agrarian security for tenant farmers, and the intertwining of religion and nationhood, which created the still pervasive synonyms of Irish and Catholic, planted its roots during this time. And the long and difficult journey towards independence created a concordance between Irish nationhood and Irish Catholicism, forging a pivotal link between religion and national identity. So in the early decades of the 19th century, a small cohort of priests ministered to a large population. In 1840, there were approximately 2,150 priests for six and a half million Catholics. So this was a grossly <coughs> inadequate ratio for successful pastoral care. But the famine was useful that way because it uh, decreased the <laughs> population. <laughs> so after 1852, the uh, ratio of priests to the faithful was considerably improved with uh, 1,783 Catholics under the care of each priest by 1861. But very few Catholics received mass and education regularly during the year, and many were never confirmed. And instead, religious observances centered around patron saints' feast days seasonal festivals, holy wells, votive offering sites, and the stations where priest, the priest said mass and heard confessions for the community in people's homes. And this was often an occasion for music and storytelling and after the priest had gone, <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul Cullen, Cardinal Paul Cullen, was one of the central figures in post-emancipation Catholic Ireland. He was appointed apostolic delegate in 1849, Archbishop of Armagh in 1850 and was transferred to the Archdiocese of Dublin in 1852 and he became Ireland's first cardinal in 1866. His connections and the authority conferred by his high-ranking positions made him a powerful force in Irish church reform. He included members of the Roman Curia as well as two popes, Gregory XVI and Pius IX, among his friends and associates. He had a prominent role in drafting the Declaration of Papal Infallibility following the First Vatican Council, and he was described by the Roman propaganda press as rather a Roman than an Irish priest. Mm -hmm. So having spent almost 30 years in Rome, Cullen's aim on his return to Ireland was to align Irish Catholic practices with those of the Roman Church. As an ultramontanist, a concept that places strong emphasis on the prerogatives and powers mm -hmm. of the Pope, he believed that the Catholic Church in every country should abide by the Roman model in matters of teaching and discipline, ensuring universal homogeneity. In opposition to ultramontanism stood Gallicanism, where civil authorities and national customs shaped Catholic <coughs> practice away from the Roman model. Cullen involved himself in education and politics, including the vexed questions of a Catholic university and the godless Queen's colleges. 
The new universities in Belfast, Cork and Galway, established by charter in 1850, did not th teach theology and were so decried by the Catholic hierarchy. In 1854, Cullen created a diocesan seminary at Holy Cross College in Clonliff, and one reason for this was his distrust of St. Patrick's College Maynooth, the largest seminary in the country. He considered it too independent, as its trustees were responsible to the state and the board numbered laymen among its members, not just bishops and he also thought its theological teaching was too Gallican. Cullen established the monthly journal Irish Ecclesiastical Record in 1864. This long-running monthly journal is a treasure trove of information on theology, liturgy, canon law, scripture, history, education and the arts, and the list of editors over the years constituted a roll call of future bishops, archbishops and cardinals. Naturally, Cullen wielded considerable influence in the appointment of Irish bishops, and unsurprisingly, he selected priests who followed his Pope-centred ideology. His nominees were rarely parish priests with pastoral experience. Instead, he chose academics or members of religious orders. <coughs> Cullen was confident and strong-willed in reorganising the Irish church, but he was also divisive. And we have a couple of quotes which will give a flavour of this. In 1908, the Catholic Encyclopedia gave a favourable gloss on his activities. Throughout his episcopate, it was his most anxious care to check Protestantism, <coughs> to promote the beauty of the house of God, and to multiply institutions of enlightenment, charity, and benevolence. But that apparently gentle phrase, most anxious care, can in fact be interpreted as an iron fist. <laughs> Almost a century later, the historian K.T. Hoppen itemised a long list of those whom Cullen perceived as his opponents in his quest for reform. <laughs> Among the Cullenite circle of the damned were virtually all Protestants, all the English, especially English Roman Catholics, <laughs> Gallican ecclesiastics, political revolutionaries, and anyone associated with the Archbishop. <laughs> <laughs> Cullen's antipathy towards Archbishop McHale stemmed from the latter's advocacy of Gallicanism. It uh, wasn't ultramontan enough. So the Cardinal wanted to diminish national enthusiasm for patron saints, seasonal festivals, holy wells, cessations, etc. And part of his mission in reorganising religious customs for both clerics and the faithful devolved around the church edifice itself, bringing the congregation and the priest together into a consecrated space for sacramental obligations. Although church building had been ongoing since the end of the 18th century, many parishes either did not have a church at all or used a building insufficiently large for a full congregation. Up to 900 churches were repaired or built between 1829 and 1860, and a sum of £4 million, which equates approximately to £480 million now, was spent on ecclesiastical architecture between 1847 and 1882. Church art in all its dazzling display, architectural, visual, aural, was a new concept for the majority of Catholics. Pre-emancipation celebrations of mass in the open air or in small chapels were liturgies of simplicity and austerity, and the change to sacramental celebration within a building, sometimes a relatively ostentatious building, required a corresponding alteration in mindset among the people. The reluctance of the population to change to Cullen's church-centred Catholicism was manifest in the habit, which persisted for more than a century, of men remaining outside the church building during mass. And I remember this myself growing up in Connemara in the 60s and 70s. All the men were smoking outside the church and talking about farming bits, and the women and the children were inside saying the prayers. So the Synod of Thurlis in 1850 was the first full plenary canonical synod convened in Ireland since the Reformation. It was Cullen's, <coughs> excuse me, it was Cullen's first big move towards reorganising the Irish church. You'll have to excuse me. I've got a bit of a throat infection, so I will have to take regular sips. The agenda for debate in the Synod included overtly political issues, such as the new Catholic university in response to those godless Queen's colleges, and Episcopal commitment to Catholic national education. Clerical duties, discipline and administration of the sacraments were also examined. Clerical practices had necessarily been clandestine during penal times, and there were no homogeneous nationwide procedures to deal with financial policy or breaches of priestly conduct. Clerics were dependent for their income on fees from baptisms, marriages, funerals and stations, and many charged sums of money which were disproportionate to the circumstances of their often extremely poor parishioners. 
Neither did priests demonstrate exemplary piety. Clerical laxity extended to hunting, sexual activity, excessive drinking, and neglect of pastoral duties. And as a barometer of alcohol consumption, Bishop's Water was the trade name of a whiskey distilled in Wexford. <laughs> Synodal proceedings were discussed and voted on by four archbishops, 23 bishops, and the Cistercian Abbot of Mount Melloray. <laughs> The decisions of the Synod were sent to Rome for ratification, after which all bishops were bound by the decrees. New disciplinary measures forbade priests to hunt, attend theatre, or drink in public, and these measures were enforced by Episcopal parish visitations. Decrees relating to clerical discipline really were just an enforcement of what had been laid down by the Council of Trent 300 years earlier, but the only difference being that the Irish bishops reserved much wider powers to regulate the actions of their clergy, which wouldn't have made Rome very happy. Some of the synodal decrees relating to administration of the sacraments had a significant impact on socio-cultural aspects of Catholic practice in Ireland. Everything which had previously been done outside of a church or in, in a landscape was now being done in a church. And although the synod was sensitive to the upset which this would cause the native Catholics, Cullen in fact pressed Rome to make sure that the practices were brought into line. And so the stations were prescribed by Rome we still have the stations today. Didn't manage to succeed in stamping those out. Music played an important part in augmenting ecclesiastical pomp and awe during the synodal ceremonies, particularly the opening. And if you're looking for a full description of the impact of the great opening ceremonies, the Tuam Herald on page four of the 31st of August 1850 will tell you everything you need to know. So the well-known hymns Veni Creator Spiritus and Ave Maristella featured during the procession and Handel's Hallelujah Chorus is played on the organ once they got into the church. The choir of St. Patrick's College Carlo apparently performed a Palestrina Mass, including the Credo, <coughs> which would have been a highly significant achievement if the press report is correct. The reporter stated that the Mass parts were, quote, chanted by the choir from the sublime music of Palestrina, unquote. But the use of the word chanted raises the query as to whether it was polyphony at all and also the performance of a polyphonic credo would have been very unusual. So although music was used to heighten the sense of occasion at the Synod, the focus really was on the twin targets of opposition to the inclusionary Queen's Colleges and clerical delinquency. So ecclesiastical art was a fairly low priority. Two decrees were made concerning church music, specifically in the context of mass, and these were embedded in a long section of decrees which dealt with sacramental procedures so, no singing in church, unless it's solemn and ecclesiastical. The rectors of seminaries must ensure, even to the extent of offering prizes, that students are well instructed in chant so that they may properly learn the sacred ceremonies. And it was Latin only, um, unless it's approved in the ecclesiastical books are permitted by the ordinary. So the first degree, first decree there is, is, you can interpret it broadly, it just requires singing to be solemn and ecclesiastical. So on this basis, sacred music, rather than strictly liturgical music, wasn't ruled out. But the requirement that a good grounding in chant was essential for seminarians put forward the expectation that priests would sing at least some components of the liturgy, and it emphasised that music had an essential place within the liturgy. And encouraging the students seminarian students chant studies by way of prizes was a novel approach and one that wasn't acted on in St. Patrick's College Maynooth for another 40 years so they weren't doing anything in a hurry and nothing at all was said about congregational participation in chant. So the second decree is more restrictive, re restricts, rejected the possibility of vernacular hymnody either in English or Irish during high mass. It also raised issues for the provision of music in the various devotional and missionary liturgies introduced by Cullen, which included adorations, novenas, benediction, and triduums, and they were all designed to bring congregations into churches. And whether by oversight or design, neither of these decrees says anything about instrumental music. So the lack of attention paid to liturgical music by the ecclesiastical authorities at this time is disappointing, but understandable. Church music, of its nature a demonstrative and glorious call of the Almighty, didn't sit well with a congregation trained to muteness by virtue of both the penal laws and the Latin mass. And the concept of congregational participation in hymnody or chant was not an intrinsic part of the Irish Catholic disposition. Some people would say that hasn't changed at all, and that's a whole other lecture. <laughs> so because music required ongoing resourcing, planning, and teaching, it was the most difficult of all the ecclesiastical adornments. 
The Nina Garden of the 18th of September 1844 regretted the absence of sacred music from our parish church through want of an organist, and it encouraged parishioners to make contributions towards an organist's salary. A letter in The Nation of the 5th of July 1845 remarked, It is an acknowledged fact that the great bulk of music for the Catholic Church in Ireland is very defective, particularly in the rural districts. And 20 years later, Cullen's Irish ecclesiastical record stated that priests cannot do anything in the country districts in the way of singing the hymns and the psalms. And went on, if the priest could have the singing, it would of course be most desirable and very edifying, but not at all necessary. This was a clear indication that the primary organ of instruction to the Irish clergy, clergy did not hold the improvement in church music standards as an important aim. Nonetheless, the journal took seriously its function of reporting decrees and edicts from Rome, even if there was little in the way of support structures by which the clergy and congregation might follow them. Advertisements for church music publications in Ireland around the mid-century revealed an interest in plain chant in urban centres at least prior to the Synod of Thurlis. And these comments are taken from the preface of a manual of instructions on plain chant or Gregorian music, which was advertised quite a lot around the time. And this one is come from the Nation of 18th of October 1845. The object of the following pages is to supply a concise and easy explanation of the rules of plain chant as differing from those of modern music, and also a sure guide for the chanting of the principal offices of the church. Both have of late been much called for by many desirous to propagate the knowledge of pure Gregorian music. To such, this manual is offered, not only for the use of the clergy, but of the laity also, to direct the priest chanting at the altar and to enable the people to respond, either in choir or through the congregation. So the fact that this manual is being directed towards the laity as well as the clergy suggests that it was only of use and intended for literate city congregations because none of the poorly educated rural uh, native Catholics would have been able to read either the text or the music. In 1847, a grammar of Gregorian or plain chant music was advertised in The Nation and The Freeman's Journal. And this volume included a dissertation on music, its notation or characters, and an explanation and history of all the characters used in plain chant. And it also included voice exercises and instructions for singing divine office. And again, this would only have been applicable to the select literate few. And another volume, the Complete Gregorian Plain Chant Manual, dated from 1849 and was published in London and Dublin. So that's Plain Chant. What else was happening? So in the 19th century, a movement for a form of church music began in Germany, gradually spreading across Europe and into America. And the need for reform stemmed from an increase in the secularization of church music. And this included the adaptation of operatic arias for use during mass, very lengthy sung and instrumental performances of the mass ordinary, and the hire of popular theatrical soloists. The behavior of fashionable congregations during church services was often less than devotional. For instance, in 1854, the Archbishop of Cologne <coughs> complained to the papal nuncio, during the Kyrie's, Gloria's, Credo's, and so forth, they walk up and down in the nave, even with a lady on the arm, and converse as if they were in a public place. They stop with their backs to the altar so they can look the soloist in the face and hang on her cadences, flourishes, and trills. Then they resume their stroll, conversing in loud voices, as if it were a promenade, or a hall, or musical program. And of all these abuses, I have only too much proof. It is an outrage. And this lack of devotional attention to the liturgy was mirrored in urban centres across Europe, including Dublin and other major cities. The controversy regarding appropriate liturgical music was fed by Romanticism's rediscovery of Renaissance and early Baroque art. In the 19th century, Palestrina and <coughs> Italian Renaissance sacred music became a touchstone for church music as writers, polemicists and historians characterised growth and development towards a golden age, that of Palestrina, and a subsequent decline as art music impinged on the sacred. Radical changes in social order during the 19th century and the great shift of populations towards urban centers as the industrial revolution reshaped Europe fed into a new zeitgeist which necessitated a reevaluation of earlier artistic norms. Church music faced the twin difficulties of exalting Renaissance music whilst debating whether it was appropriate to incorporate in newly composed liturgical music the ongoing technical and harmonic developments found within orchestral and vocal romantic music. 
Regensburg in Germany became the centre of a coordinated attempt at church music reform through priest and composer Franz Witt. Witt argued against both the artistic and liturgical merit of many mass settings by <coughs> Renaissance masters, including Lassus and Palestrina. He decried extensive imitation, excessive lyricism, and any working of the text which strayed from a liturgically correct iteration, including a condemnation of lengthy settings of short texts. These were precisely the aspects of polyphonic writing which were censured by the Council of Trent 300 years earlier. The Sicilian movement under Witt promulgated homophony and textually concise polyphony rather than elaborate and extended forms. Some members reduced the scope of musical composition even further. For instance, Michael Haller took the position that chromaticism was unbecoming to church music because it could arouse passionate feelings rather than, <laughs> rather than elevate the listener toward God. <coughs> Witt intended his principles of reform to reach out not only to cathedrals but also to every village church. This broad ambition was both a strength and weakness for Sicilianism. Although it aimed for equality amongst church musicians, in practice it meant that poor quality compositions abounded and complex music was often badly performed. The mission to spread the work of church music reform resulted in an outpouring of new church music. Efforts to participate in the revival of chant and emulation of polyphony had mixed outcomes. An artistically inferior work which satisfied liturgical requirements met approval more easily than a compositionally sound work which might even slightly contravene liturgical rules. A listing in the Sicilian movement's white list was not intended to confer a seal of artistic approval, but merely to indicate its suitability for liturgical use. Franz Haberl was director of music at Regensburg Cathedral and founder of the Royal, church of, the Royal School of Church Music in Regensburg, and he was one of the referees for the white list. And he was critical of the inclusion of liturgically functional works which were devoid of artistic merit. He argued that a narrow perception of church music kept within the confines of chant and emulation of Trent-approved Renaissance style, could only generate a barren art form. Witt, on the other hand, emphasised the necessity of providing music suitable for village churches and simple inartistic pieces which satisfied a liturgical function, he thought, had their place. And the artistic differences between Witt and Haberl created tensions within the movement for church music reform. Of course, it should be said that Second-rate compositions are endemic to all eras and all genres. But the difference in the 19th century was that the ease and cheapness with which the music was printed and disseminated meant that everybody was capable of getting a large collection of second-rate music in a way that wouldn't have happened in earlier times when printing was much more costly. So that, that was the only difference, really. An awful lot more of the second-rate stuff was able to survive and be disseminated to a far greater, far wider geographical area. So the increasing secularisation of church music was also found in Irish cities and towns. And for instance, an article in the Dublin Review of September 1844 complained that devout Christians were doomed Sunday after Sunday to hear the most holy of names minced with the insinuating effeminacy are trilled out with the tutored grace of the theatre or the concert room. <laughs> Greater wealth and a more sophisticated congregation permitted more opportunities for musical display in major urban centres. Press accounts of ceremonial masses in large towns around Ireland during the 1850s itemised concert music by Handel, Haydn, Mendelssohn, Mozart, Rossini and Weber, and also the widespread use of vocal soloists. The Hallelujah Chorus, often played on the organ without a choir, and excerpts from Rossini's Stabat Mater were particularly popular. From its opening in 1825, Dublin's Pro Cathedral adopted concerted music and a theatrical style. Hayden Corrie, the first organist and director of music, was the, was the first organist and director of music there, and the overlap between church and stage in 19th century Dublin was typified by Corrie's successor, John William Glover, who was a theatre orchestra violinist as well as director of music at Pro Cathedral. And Glover's grandson, James Glover, also combined church and stage in his youth before he became master of music at London's Drury Lane Theatre. And speaking of the, the Dublin Pro Cathedral <coughs> scenario, he recounted, for all the artistes sang in one or other of the Catholic churches on Sunday, and this replenished the poor box. This also created rivalry among the churches, all of which struggled for the better programmes. Imagine it. A mass service sung by Chechens, Sinico, Santli, Vizzani, Cotogni and Trebelli, all of whom were members of the Grand Italian Opera Theatre Company. 
Um, so Glover's remarks divulge an unexpected motivation for ecclesiastes to retain a theatrical element to church music economics. The provision of concerted music ensured congregations from a higher social class who could contribute larger sums to the church collections. Of course, the other reason, critical reason, is that there was no means in this country of training church musicians in appropriate liturgical music. And that really was the crux of it. So another person of influence in the church music reform in Ireland was Bishop Nicholas Donnelly. He was a bishop, musician and historian, and he formed the nexus between Ireland and the European Sicilian movement. He was a frequent traveller to Europe, and he was very impressed when he first heard the choir at Regensburg Cathedral in 1873. Donnelly described the position of church music in Ireland in his correspondence with Franz Haberl, director uh, of music at the cathedral. And Donnelly made the point that since Ireland had no resources by which church musicians might be trained, there was no alternative but to use theatre artists. The same letter also contained the information that the Pro Cathedral had a budget of £200 annually to pay an organist, three sopranos, one contralto, one tenor and one bass. And Donnelly commented that these professional singers were paid and paid well. And he lamented the endless succession of masses by Beethoven, Haydn, Mozart, Rossini and Weber. Donnelly continued to visit Regensburg <coughs> annually and he formed a very close relationship with Haberl. And the ongoing work of the Sicilian movement in Germany and in Europe impressed Donnelly. And in 1878, he founded the Irish Society of St. Cecilia and he became its first president. And as an aside, there was also around the same time a Harmonic Society of St. Cecilia in Dublin and it presented large and small scale sacred works in a concert format with the aim of popularizing Catholic church music. But this society was almost the direct opposite of the Irish Society of St. Cecilia, um, which was aiming for strictly liturgical music. Donnelly also established Lyra Ecclesiastica, the journal of the Irish Society of St. Cecilia, which ran, albeit non-continuously, from 1878 to 1894. The new society's first meeting in Dublin was in 1878, and it was attended by a large number of clergy from Dublin and other urban centres. And the objectives laid out by the society adhered closely to German Sicilian ideals and promoted Sicilian music. So the order of importance of ranking of liturgical music was Gregorian and Fain chant first, then harmonised vocal <coughs> music, whether ancient or modern, if suitable for ecclesiastical art and the liturgy. And then the next rank down was hymns and other sacred chants in English of religious and approved character. And that was to be used at devotional liturgies rather than mass. And then next down was organ playing in the correct church style. And finally, instrumental music, as far as tolerated by the church, and when used only to support the singing. So that was the ranking of things. And what else did they? And they also said... Well, one of the objects of the Sicilian society is to banish from our churches what is certainly known to be profane music. Occasionally the words of the liturgy are tortured in the most painful fashion <laughs> and rendered perfectly unintelligible in order to fit them to that charming air from Der Freischutz or that charming duet from Maritana. The editors will consider it part of their duty to publish in each number, that was of Lyra Ecclesiastica, a sort of index expurgatorius of these forbidden adaptations, <laughs> and so to gradually eliminate them from our choirs and organ galleries. So the society had a whitelist, which was modelled on the German Sicilian whitelist, and the Gregorian chant took pride of place, and next favoured were polyphonic motets by Palestrina and other Renaissance masters. And then modern composers favoured by Irish Sicilianism included a whole plethora of German um, composers. So the larger Dublin churches were quite enthusiastic about adopting Sicilian ideals, and particularly, of course, those who had professionally trained musicians in the choir gallery. But it was more difficult for the society to make headway in the rest of the country. And any progress in the rest of Ireland really was as much attributable to the many continentally trained organists and musicians who were the mainstay for liturgical music in the larger cities outside the Pale. So the society itself <coughs> didn't manage to have a huge amount of effect outside, outside Dublin. To further its aims in church music reform, Nicholas Donnelly, with the backing of Dublin's Archbishop <coughs> William Walsh, wrote to Haberl, seeking his recommendation for a suitable musician to take up the newly created chair of church chant and organ at St. Patrick's College, Maynooth. And having briefly considered coming to Ireland himself, 
Haberl instead recommended Heinrich Beverunga, a young cleric who had just completed his church music studies at Regensburg. Beverunga came to Ireland in September 1888. He was a highly skilled musician, performer and scholar who made significant contributions not just to Irish church music but also to secular music education and to Irish traditional music and beyond Ireland to the contentious European debate on the interpretation of plain chant. After nine years in Ireland, Beverunga wrote with passion and dismay in the Irish ecclesiastical report concerning the condition of church music. I have heard within recent times church music that is an outrage and a scandal, I might almost say a blasphemy, for the character of that music would seem to presuppose qualities in God that are derogatory to his sanctity. I have heard such music even in the convents of nuns. I have heard those sacred virgins defile their lips with strains suitable only for the expression of sentiments that they would utterly abhor, the mere suggestion of which, in spoken language, would make them blush and fly away. <laughs> Is it the utter absence of an appreciation for the fitness of things, or the overpowering influence of, influence of early associations and continued habitude that make these things possible? His comments were reported as far afield as Boston, with the aim of motivating reflection on the condition of church music in America. Now, it has to be said, Beverunga was not generally given to flowery rhetoric, and this quite uncharacteristic diatribe may have been prompted by some particularly deplorable music choices from nuns during one of his convent visits. But on one occasion in private correspondence to an English Benedictine friend, he described the music in a Jesuit church as seventh-rate comic opera. <laughs> Beverunga recommended a variety of mass settings for two and three part equal voice choirs, as well as mixed choirs. Um, and all the settings were contemporary German Sicilian compositions. And this was one of the things that was somewhat held against him, and that it was felt that he didn't give enough support to some of the um, Irish composers of Sicilian music. But there's a huge number of issues surrounding that, which I absolutely don't have time to go into here. Um, so outside his post at Maynooth, Beverunga's portfolio of activities reflected the diversity of tasks required to disseminate the work of church music reform. He undertook innumerable engagements as performer and conductor, many of which entailed travel around the country. He was in demand as a solo chanter, organist, pianist, choral trainer and conductor. He undertook diocesan visits on Episcopal, Episcopal request to advise on sacred music. And correspondence shows that he visited, among other far from flung places, Carzavine, Tralee, Limerick, Monaghan, Formoy, Ennis, Listudvarna, and Kiltimach. And although the railway system in Ireland was extensive, travel was a slow and often difficult undertaking. And for instance, the journey from Maynooth to Carzavine took a day and a half. And when he got to Carzavine on one occasion, actually, he uh, was trying out a new organ in a church down there, and uh, the priest had. Uh, broadcast that he was going to play a recital, but the priest hadn't told Beverunga that, so it was, it was just handy that Beverunga happened to have brought some music with him. <coughs> Many of Beverunga's activities placed him within a social and cultural milieu which represented a modernising Ireland. He was a member of numerous literary and musical societies, including the Dublin Orchestral Society, the Dublin Musical Society, the Gaelic League, the Irish Folk Song Society and the Cash Cool Association. Internationally, he was a member of the Incorporated Society of Musicians in England and the International Musicological Society, and he assisted in establishing an Irish branch of the IMS in 1905. He was also active as a translator, writer and reviewer. He provided many reviews and articles for national and international periodicals, um, including as far afield as, as um, Philadelphia in, in the USA. Once he had established his teaching routine in Maynooth, he began to campaign for better music education in Irish schools. From 1895 onwards, he was a member of the panel of examiners for music. He acted as a syllabus consultant, examiner and teacher for the Leinster School of Music. And his 1897 in the article in the Irish Ecclesiastical Record entitled The Teaching of Music in Irish Schools painted a very clear picture of music education in Ireland generally and the lack of musical attainments of young seminarians in Maynooth. So, quote, most of the students enter here with their voices and ears absolutely untrained. Most of the time allotted to Gregorian chant has to be spent in teaching the very rudiments of music, awakening the first sensations of musical intervals, and trying to get some musical sound out of the rough and uncultured voices, unquote. He argues that adequate music teaching should form an essential part of primary and intermediate education in Ireland. 
He recognised that his problem in Maynooth was precisely replicated in the teacher training colleges, where trainees themselves had no prior music experience. The report of the Commissioners of National Education in Ireland for 1888 revealed a shocking lack of musical ability on the part of teachers in training. Less than 50% of men who enrolled for two years training were able to sing the notes of a tonic triad with instrumental accompaniment after several weeks practising for two and a half hours per week. <laughs> In 1914, Fair Brother was awarded the new part-time Chair of Music at University College Dublin, and the choice of a foreign cleric for the Chair of Music caused a furore in the press. The Trinity term of 1914 was the only period in which he was able to take up this new post. He spent July 1914 in Leipzig, investigating progressive methods of teaching in the university there, and he was still in Germany, visiting his family, when war broke out in August 1914. He was unable to return to Ireland until 1920, by which time he was gravely ill, and one of his great regrets was the loss of his post at UCD. His inability to return to Ireland for so long following the outbreak of war was a critical circumstance in the history of both church music reform and secular music pedagogy in Ireland. Having achieved professorships in two institutions, Maynooth and UCD, Beverunga could have looked forward to significantly increased influence on educational policy and his relationship with the Archbishop of Dublin, who was also Chancellor of UCD, gave him a further advantage. The unexpected end of his influence in Ireland had a markedly negative effect on church music, and a deterioration in standards immediately resulted. Maynooth lapsed into its old habits of using senior students to teach a limited range of chant, and it was 1927 before a new professor of music was appointed there. Nine years later, Belfast-based Belgian organist Arthur de Moonmeester advocated identical reforms to those which Beverunga had urged many decades previously, the use of appropriate liturgical music, the importance of learning basic musical skills at an early age, improvement in standards of congregational singing, and so on. By mid-20th century, there was still no means through which Irish musicians could be trained for liturgical work, and congregational singing continued to be poor. And it was another 20 years before the establishment in 1970 of a second level music education program with a focus on church music requirements and this was the Scola Cantorum at St. Finian's College in Monagar. And even more shockingly, it was the 21st century before females were admitted there. <laughs> so the evolution of Catholic church music in Ireland during and after the 19th century is not a positive story. The period of growth and development from the establishment of the Society of St. Cecilia until the outbreak of war halted almost immediately with Beverunga's departure. And the major figures driving reform, principally Nicholas Donnelly, Archbishop William Walsh and Beverunga, were all dead by 1923. So this has been very much a whistle-stop tour and there's a huge number of issues and points of interest which I haven't had time to mention at all. So maybe next year if there's another lecture series. <laughs> I don't know how you all are for time or anything, but I'm quite happy to take questions if anybody wants to ask or say anything. I have just a very quick question. It seems amazing to me in, in Ireland that just one person could have so much uh, of an influence. It's just that, there's not, that it's not spread out over a couple of people. That it, you just, I suppose when I think of people like Fleischmann, this sort of thing, yeah. and he can actually just change it. it, it just, it's yeah. amazing that one person can make such a big difference. As it is, and, and some of it is down very much to the tight reins of the ecclesiastical hierarchy and that there is one or two people making all of the decisions about who's allowed to do educational things, who's allowed to do anything at all within the institutions. And for instance, in Dublin, with very much William Walsh, Archbishop William Walsh, would have been the be all and the end all of, of how, how much you were allowed to do. Um, for instance, Beberunga came up with a plan to uh, run a series of lectures for a large group of nuns from various different uh, orders and to have them all together to give the lectures to them. And Archbishop William Moore said, no, nope, can't have that, you can't have all the, I can't mix up the orders like that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it so happens that, that Beverunga and William Walsh had, had a very turbulent relationship and, and a lot of things that were both good and bad came out of the turbulence of it. But you're, you're right, I mean, there, there are a certain number of really influential people and you sometimes wonder if they had been less influential, would things actually have been more successful on the ground? So. 
I'm just, uh, I see you, you concentrate a lot on the uh, Gregorian chant aspect of things. Mm. I'm just wondering, I would have thought that prior to Vatican II, which I'm just old enough to remember, unfortunately, um, I would have thought all the devotional Latin hymns, for things like benediction hymns, for example. Um, I'm just wondering, and all the devotional hymns, you didn't have occasion to mention those. No, I, I'm wondering why, why you see the Gregorian chant as being the key thing. Because I wouldn't have thought it would have been, would it? It was the key thing because it was the the top-ranking style and genre of music that was uh, promoted by the church itself. But and in the cathedrals, I mean, would it would it be surely parish churches wouldn't it be able to sing the Gregorian chant, would they? Only if they had, if they had a choir, yes. If they, if they had the, this is the thing. You see, the rural, small, poor parishes they didn't get a look in for any of this, and there wouldn't have been there would have been virtually no singing in really rural, poor parishes. But so the, the wealthier you get, the more of a variety of music you would have had within each church. But the chant was the number one thing which was approved and promoted by the Sicilian movement on behalf of the ecclesiastical hierarchy. So that's one of the reasons that was focused on that. And the English hymns were about third or fourth down the rank of what was permitted and approved. Surely the church was extremely emotional and all these things like sacred heart devotions and all those statue related, you know, yes. Marian hymns, lurids, all those sorts of things. Surely they would be known by absolutely everybody uh, during this period. I was surprised <coughs> that they, whether the, the, the hierarchy liked it or not, I would have thought they were the commonly known things. And I'd be surprised to know, mm -hmm. I know Gregorian mm -hmm. chant was taught in Catholic schools routinely. Yes. And therefore, it was an official church yes. uh, religious mm -hmm. education thing. That's true. But I'm surprised that um, that uh, the devotional hymns related to devotions and things like benediction and processional hymns too. Because sure, remember, a lot of those were also Latin chant hymns. They weren't necessarily English at all. The number in English would have been very small and would only have come in sort of the start of the 20th century. The devotions that you're referring to are the ones that a Cardinal Cullen brought in to try and get the Irish away from their own native practices. Um, and so they were only coming in from mid-century onwards. And the use of hymns in the vernacular in both English and Irish was a, quite a late arrival. Quite, we're talking at the end of the 19th century into the 20th century. So if you were to look, for instance, at the number of Irish hymns that they sang in Seminary Maynooth at around about the end of the 19th century, there were maybe three or four that were in use. If you come 20 years later, up to 1920, then suddenly there were maybe 20 or a dozen to 20 that were in use. But a lot of the devotional material was still Latin hymns. I mean, you're, you're, so that it wasn't just that there, there, were, there wasn't a whole pile of English hymns came in as soon as mid-century appeared. It wasn't like that. I'm just thinking of things like Faith in Our Fathers. Was that not a that would have been in the that later? Time? That would have been the later in the 19th century. Yes, yes, it would have been. And a number of a number of influential hymnals came out towards the end of the 19th century. And um, one of, one of those in particular, uh, the Saint Patrick's Hymn Book, which was um, promulgated by a Vincentian priest from Cork, um, <coughs> Edward Gaynor. He brought out an edition of mostly mostly English with Latin hymns, and it, the first edition of that was very poorly received on a, on a critical, musically critical and um, textually critical basis, in that the words were just too, um, they might have been devotional, but they were too secular. So only a certain number of hymns from that were found their way into popular use. But yes, things of faith of our, faith of our fathers would, would have been around by the time we come at the end of the century, they would have been pretty popular for those kind of devotions. But just a very gradual um, move into English hymns. So I wonder, was there a difference between music in secular churches and music in order churches? Yes, the divine office would have been used much more in the order churches. Well, I was thinking yeah. more of the popular, sort of popular devotions. Or what I remember somebody remarking to me one time, I love the smell of the tent of Virgo. <laughs> yes, <laughs> those comes with inbuilt incense. Yes. Yeah. Tanta Virgo was very popular from early on in a lot of places. Yeah. So benediction was again benediction was one of the things that Cullen brought in, and it was one of the things that seemed to kind of catch on fairly well uh, with its attendant um, processional and items and hymns. Yeah. Um, you, so you're suggesting was there a difference in the music between order churches and parish churches? Yeah, I, I suppose I'm thinking of um, maybe sometime later than 
mid mid twentieth century, shall I say? Mid twentieth. Yeah. Know. That's well. That's a lot later and on. I know that. Again. The main yeah. difference. I was wondering whether it had, whether it had been there earlier. Uh, the main difference earlier on really would have been available resources and money. The order churches would have had more of it. The poor parish churches would have had barely two farthings to rub together. So that really is, is at that, at the training, the ability to bring in a trained musician. And they're the things that made the crucial differences for the uh, smaller and more rural churches. Uh, what about the O'Brien brothers? Mm. Mm. Uh, they were kind of very influential, weren't they, in the city of Dublin? They were in the city of Dublin, that's right, yes. Did they train abroad? Um, the, we're into the whole pro-cathedral choir thing at this point, which is one of the things that I didn't mention at all because it kind of deserves a, a lecture all to itself. Um, but yes, um, the, the formation of the pro-cathedral choir was uh, sponsored by Edward Martin and um, is, a, is a huge and fascinating story. And Edward Martin put very, very strict um, regulations into the constitution of the pro choir about what they were allowed to do. Really, really very strict as regards what they could do and when they could do it. So Vincent O'Brien was under Edward Martin's thumb as regards what he could do. In the background, Beverunga was attending the early rehearsals <laughs> of the pro choir and advising on stylistic performances and artistry. And he and Edward Martin couldn't really be too close together in the same room or there might be a certain amount of ructions because they disagreed publicly on certain things. In fairness, they disagreed publicly on certain things, but they actually were very much ad idem uh, in their personal relationship because it was, it was through Edward Martin that Beverunga got into the whole uh, Gaelic League and all that sort of things. But yes, Vincent O'Brien in the Pro Cathedral, the establishment of the Pro Cathedral Choir was a breakthrough for, um, for church music. Uh, Catholic Church music here, but there wasn't really anything else anywhere else in the country that could replicate that. Cork had its uh, Cork had some bits and pieces, but the, there was a huge dichotomy between what was available resource-wise in Dublin and what was going on in the rest of, of the country, and that's where the whole continental organist thing that I mentioned came into being because it was mostly to the more rural cities that the continental organists ended up going, and. Um, there was an unfortunate backlash against continental organists and continental musicians, same as always, coming here, taking our jobs. But <laughs> they couldn't do anything else because there was nobody native who could do the work. And Beverunga spent many, many times at public lectures and everything else trying to get an Irish establishment for training of Irish, native Irish musicians, trying to get that going. But I mean, it's, it just never happened. Never happened. Um, so that, that doesn't really address what you asked, but... <laughs> Thank you very much for listening.